What is good, guys and gals, and welcome to the Films and Pixels podcast, episode 26. I am your host, Afif. And I know it's been some time, but, um, you know, with a lot of work problems going on that I need to deal with and, you know, trying to find some topics, you know, just juggling a lot, but, uh, you know, I'm still ready to go. So regarding the topics, I got some stuff that I've had on hold and I want to discuss. So, one, you know, some of these topics do include a couple of massive games that are not yet released and there's no timeline for them to be released, getting like leaked alpha footage. It's been pretty disastrous, so I will mention those. Uh, plus news of Razer possibly like releasing or at least for now teasing uh, a handheld device and then maybe releasing it obviously like in the near future, but also... Uh, Google are kind of in trouble. Uh, you know, there are some developers frustrated with Google regarding Stadia, and I'll explain that. Uh, a major Deadpool 3 announcement. I'm sure we've all seen that by now, but it's still pretty exciting. And Blade. Why did the director of Blade suddenly step down? I'll talk about that. Plus examining the hot take trailer. What is this uh, hot take trailer I'm talking about? I'll explain it. And plus something interesting about Intel's Unison app and how it can bridge the gap between Windows and iOS. That sounds pretty interesting to me. So yeah, if you haven't before, um, you know, again, please subscribe to this channel. It's really going to help me boost, uh, you know, engagement, interactivity and all that good stuff. It'd be really good. More views. Please comment, comment section below, like and follow. The pages in the description section. <clears throat> That'd be really good for me and I really appreciate it. So, but yeah, without further ado, let's get going for episode 26. All right, guys and gals, uh, most of you may have been aware by now, but a couple of major leaks have hit the internet and companies like Blizzard and Rockstar Games are not exactly happy, happy with the circumstances they find themselves in and really by now um, they're you know they're still trying to recover from I'll start with the major major one and that's obviously GTA 6 or at least the next un untitled Grand Theft Auto game but it's obviously going to be GTA 6 details have been emerging in the past month or so in a good way at least like regarding protagonists you know it could be like lead female protagonist and in the setting similar to like Vice City, the fictional Miami um, as well. And of course, it's going to be even bigger open world. But, you know, there was a pre-alpha footage that got leaked that lasted like 90 minutes. And I thought it was just a hoax. But somehow the unfinished gameplay footage of GTA 6 got leaked. And it did show like a lead playable female character for the upcoming game. And what's even... Worse is that, you know, the even like Rockstar themselves like had to like put out a statement saying like, you know, this won't affect our development. But that it just sucks because, you know, now all the buzz has been killed for this game, you know, like all the excitement. But, you know, there's still a long way to go. There's no unannounced dates or anything. You know, there's no release date or any sort of thing. But it just really sucks. Although the situation did develop since then. And I'm really glad I'm doing this episode now because like. An 18-year-old UK hacker got arrested. So someone hacked the game, went into their encryption security, and just leaked any sort of test footage online for GTA 6. A similar situation around that same time actually happened with Blizzard's Diablo 4. Diablo 4 is something that a lot of people are looking forward to with the action RPG dungeon crawler game. You know, so even footage for that game got leaked online. And it just really sucks. I mean, this is an, a gaming industry that really is used to leaks. And it's not like anyone's happy about it, you know. I remember, I think it was like two years ago, just before, uh, I think a month or two before the release of The Last of Us Part Two, the entire uh, story and plot got leaked online. Who, I think, maybe it's a bit unknown, but everyone was at Naughty Dog, one of the studios, Sony owns got really devastated with that whole situation and really heartbroken. So, um, 
You know, it, regarding the GTA 6 situation, it's known as probably the biggest hack, the biggest leak ever. And, you know, this whole thing was really disastrous. So, I, um, you know, it's just hard to know how they, they can really salvage from this. The only thing I'm sure they'll do is like some kind of lawsuit against the kid, whoever he is. But other than that, I mean... You know, if in my opinion, they have to scrap the whole project and think of something new. Try because GTA Five, whether we like it or not, even to this day, it continues to make billions and billions of dollars and um, still like really popular amongst open world games. And so it's just going to be really hard to follow up the hype of GTA Five for the next uh, game. Uh, obviously, going to be GTA Six. All right, guys and gals, uh, once again, staying in the gaming section just for another moment. Um, you know, reports circulating that three major techno technology technology companies, sorry for that, Razer, Qualcomm, and Verizon collaborating together what is supposed to be like a 5G gaming hand handheld device, which is still pretty exciting. Uh, you know, there's going to be uh, what it seems to be a Razer Edge 5G going to be presented at the Mobile World Congress in Las Vegas. Um, maybe they've, or maybe it's already been known by now, but it seems like the chipset will have the, uh, for Qualcomm Snapdragon G3X Gen 1, you know? So the chip itself was already known like back in December of last year, which is pretty cool. But as for the actual chipset, it's gonna be like an Andreno GPU capable that's gonna be running Android games at like 144 frames per second, which is insane compared to uh, today's new modern consoles at like 120 FPS. So that's something. And of course, there's going to be like 10 bit, uh, like, you know, HDR support, uh, 5G Wi Fi, uh, and you're going to be using like fast connect Wi Fi system with like, with like 600, 6900 systems, something like that. So that's pretty cool. Over a year, like development kits for developers for handheld PC gaming, mobile gaming have been like given to like development companies for this. So it'll be useful as well. It did feature like 120 Hertz kits and also like a 6.65 .6 inch OLED display. Like that's at least going to be like what the unit itself will be like. So I thought that was pretty cool with four way speakers and all that. But um, I think like at least a prototype may have been displayed, but I think it's still pretty good. Now, at least according to Verizon's Android games will, can be played locally and streamed from the cloud and consoles and all that sort of stuff. So I like how it puts Razer in an interesting space with, with what Logitech and Valve already have. And I really like what I'm seeing, like slowly, but surely there's like this wave of like, dedicated handheld games whether it's for mobile or cloud or remote gaming for consoles whatever it is i just think that like that's pretty cool even if it's like one of them using valve's steam os integration that's really nice to see it may cost 350 um maybe some will find a hefty price tag for what it can do but in the market today that's pretty nice 350 is really the same price tag as the Nintendo Switch OLED model that came out like early October 2021. So I think that's fine. But, you know, I guess price tags for some of these handheld tech gaming devices, I think that's pretty subjective, especially when you compare them, like one will be more expensive than the other. But that's like totally fine, you know? And yeah, like today's 16. So I think by now, Razer, Qualcomm, and Verizon may have share details already on their uh, collaboration at the RazorCon. So if you want to know more of what's happened already at RazorCon, go check it out. But I really do like this space of like more handheld gaming devices slowly but surely coming into the market, especially with mobile Android phones and especially the iPhone, uh, iPhones and, you know, the iPad still being more popular than ever. All right, so remember earlier when I mentioned Google? Yeah, they're in a bit of a strange situation. Nothing bad, but they did announce that they're officially going to be shutting down uh, their cloud gaming Stadia service. So 
sooner or later, Stadia, all the games, the hardware, the platform, whatever it is, everything Stadia is going to be stopped working. No more games, no more going to get games, download games, whatever. Cloud gaming on Stadia, that's totally going to be over, done and over. So that's pretty awful. But let me say it this way. I mean, look, I know it's Google. They have the finances. They have the ambition. But who's going to play games like The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Red Dead Redemption 2, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Doom Eternal on the cloud? Okay, like so many countries have stable internet. And then there are so many countries that don't have stable internet. Like who wants to play those games when... They're easily accessible to play without the need of Wi-Fi. I know the whole reason for that city. I remember that video conference just to, you know, release the tension of like waiting for installations, downloads, updates, and so forth to be happening before you start the game. I get that. But it's not like cloud gaming is everyone's favorite way of playing. I mean... Look at the Switch. I mean, the Switch does have some major games that are only available on the cloud and not everyone's exactly happy with how they're being integrated. You know, whether it's Control or Hitman 3 or Kingdom Hearts 3, just a few examples. So uh, it's not a shock that Stadia are shutting down and developers that have released their games are furious with Google just for not uh, giving them a notice ahead of time. So now they have to scramble how to uh, you know, help players bring their progress, their saved data over from Stadia to uh, any sort of PC gaming platform or PC gaming app for their Windows games or even Mac OS games, you know? So they're, they'll figure it out, but they're trying to sc scramble, find a way, uh, you know, is there a sort, is there like a discount for if they, let's say, um, you know, if they bought a certain game on Stadia, is there a way that they can play it on, you know, whatever, Steam or Epic or whatever it may be? Like, they're, now they have to, like, kind of figure out. So d some of the developers are kind of in a tough situation trying to accommodate the whole Stadia shutdown. But, I mean, you know, the writing has been on the wall because earlier this year, uh, Google did shut down their first party in-house studios for Stadia games. So... I mean, it was going to happen sooner or later. I will say one good thing regarding Stadia. I like the design of their gamepad, you know? And yes, it's meant for the actual Stadia thing, but I mean, it would be cool if it could work on, on uh, you know, Sony and Microsoft consoles. I really doubt it. I just, it just looks cool. It's just a thought, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's a nice looking design that has a mixture of PlayStation, Xbox layout and design, but uh, other than that, I mean, you know, um, I guess like it's finally come to a merciful end for Stadia. Yeah. Okay, so by now you're already aware of this viral YouTube video with Ryan Reynolds giving an update regarding Deadpool 3. And, you know, I think that's really cool. That's really exciting. You know, he announced that there's a release date. And even much bigger news, Hugh Jackman coming back as Wolverine, supposedly one more time. That's great, right? Uh, supposedly in phase five, or, phase five or six. But again, that's still really, really great, right? Yes and no. Yes, because again, phase four through six, it's the multiverse saga. So that's really cool and exciting and all that, you know. Also, no, me personally, I'm kind of a concerned because when Logan was released back in 2016, or excuse me, the year after that, Logan in 2017, in March, I remember coming to uh, going to see at the at the movie theater at that time, and like, oops, sorry, I was wowed and amazed by everything from the colors, the action, the dialogue, cinema, just just everything, you know, like. I even love that because of Deadpool 1, it encouraged James Mangold to really turn it up a notch and have it more R-rated. And that's exactly what happened. And it was marketed as like Hugh Jackman's swan song, last time final acting role as Wolverine. So, um, you know, and when you consider what happened by the end of Logan, I'm just 
worry that you know with Deadpool three, it kind of like I I don't want it to hurt the you know the impact and even like the legacy of Logan, you know. But even then, like there is a Fallout video where both of them were just like Logan, we're not touching that. It takes place in twenty twenty nine and all that, but still the existence the synopsis of like Wolverine and Deadpool three. And then, like, you know, oh, wait, one more time for Hugh Jackman. I don't know. I'm just just worried, like, it kind of hurts Logan's place, you know? I, I know that Logan is not an MCU film, but, you know, I, I just feel like it hurts the impact a little bit, you know? Like, you know, you just thought, like, it's based on old man Logan comics, so just to give, give you a reminder. So, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just worried that, like, now Logan, like, it's just looked at as, like, has no meaning with in terms of the x-men marvel lore you know and that movie was released just before the major blockbuster fox disney merger that happened two years afterwards so that's still the thing but i will be fair plot details not really known yes there is a release date and i think it's a phase five film but still it's a bit concerning but there's this trend i'm noticing like actors from previous non-MCU movies with the multiverse being integrated. We saw that in Spider-Man No Way Home. A bunch of actors in that movie, really a celebration of Spider-Man and what is what I still consider the best film in the Phase 4 era, right? And then Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, we saw uh, Patrick Stewart coming back as uh, Charles Xavier, even if it's just for one scene. And, well, his fate was sealed quickly. But And also another casting. This was more of a fan casting of John Krasinski as uh, Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic, even though he's not going to stay as the character officially for the Fantastic Four MCU, MCU reboot. But this was more like a fun fan casting, you know? And then now we're seeing here for... Hugh Jackman as Wolverine for Deadpool 3. So we're noticing this trend. Like they're really going with the multiverse theme of this new MCU era, phase four through phase six. So um, I think this is why there's uh, why he's back. And maybe like, I don't know, we'll know more details over time and what the teaser trailer and all that will look like. But I, I'm just really concerned that, you know, uh, yes, this is like maybe everyone's dream. Nothing wrong with being excited about this. But like I've said, I'm just worried that this will help or not not even help. Sorry about that. This will significantly hurt Logan as a film, you know, especially when you consider everything that's happened. It's just like, okay, after, just with Logan dead, like, okay, what? That's it? Like as if nothing happened? Like it's sort of the same thing. Like if all of a sudden... Robert Downey Jr. comes back as Iron Man, then it's like all that that happened in Endgame was for nothing. So, you know, that's all my concern is like just its place in the whole Marvel lore and filmmaking. For this segment, I'm going to stay where I am with in terms of Kevin Feige and everything happening with the MCU. All right. So, um, bit of a strange situation that all of a sudden occurred uh, the director for blade which the movie was supposed to start shooting next month uh basam tarik uh, all of a sudden he left the project so he's not going to be directing blade anymore but he will stay on as the executive producer for the film however uh because of that whole thing going on now it's gone delayed and pre-production has been halted for now so uh, they're now in search of a new director which in turn and it's a good thing that i'm recording this episode a bunch of films now have got delayed and being slated for new release dates so it's not likely it's going to be filming next month now you're like me and you're wondering what happened and who and why? Well, first, sources have told news outlets that it seems like the lead actor, Maharshala Ali, was not exactly happy, happy with the script, you know, some of the action action sequences that could be happening, uh, the length of the movie itself, 
being 19 minutes, you know, he thought the script was short. 90, 90 pages is uh, equals to 90 minutes. Yes, I still remember some screenwriting class and, and all that good stuff. But so, yeah, when producer and actor, you know, feeling like things are not going right in, in the pre-production stage and not yet started filming, things have changed. You know, new voice, new director being in charge now of the film. So instead of Bassam Tariq, who's still going to have a role as executive producer, and, you know, says that he was thankful for being involved in all that. Now it has to be someone else and they have to go for search again. It's a good thing, like I mentioned before, they found director for Fantastic Four. So again, let me help you all. If you don't know who Bassam Tariq is, um, he's a filmmaker who was born in Karachi, Pakistan. He did study advertising at the University of Texas and graduated in 2008. Uh, he did, like, produce video feature stories for... Time, a short film for The New Yorker, and he even co-directed a PSA to encourage vaccination vaccination against polio in Pakistan. So I thought, I mean, those are really good efforts there. Um, he did work uh, as a copywriter for different agencies in New York as well. Uh, there were names I saw on Wikipedia, but I, I just don't have them on top of my head. Um, also, something I, he did in 2009, I really liked. Uh, Bassam Tariq and his friend, Aman Ali, um, they started like doing a... They did a project where they were blogging, or if you want me to say it properly, vlogging, like videos. Uh, it's called 30 Mosques in 30 Days. What it was, like during Ramadan, uh, both of them... Um, they they broke their fast at different mosques around New York each night of Ramadan, and they sh and they even shared their stories on Tumblr. It's still a relevant thing you may re know or Tumblr. I, but I mean again, there wasn't Instagram and all that in two thousand nine. So you know Tumblr's still relevant, but that's still fine. But yeah, anyway, uh, in twenty thirteen he did co-direct These Birds Walk with. Uh, Oman Mulik. Uh, the, uh, the film is his first feature length documentary and it does follow uh, street children in Pakistan. And it did get a Netflix release date. I don't know if it's still there anyway. But even a year later, 2014, he did host a TED Talk titled The Beauty and Diversity of Muslim Life. So again, that's that's really great. Like all this good, all these facts. And, you know, the Sundance Institute awarded Tariq and Mulek for their film, The Art of Nonfiction Fellowship in twenty January 2016. So that's still pretty good. Uh, even like since that time, he was director, producer, and writer for a documentary short film called Ghosts of Sugarland that got released in 2019. And then a year later, he did uh, uh, work on his first feature film, full feature film, called Mogul Mowgli, yeah, Mogul Mowgli, um, starring his a collaborator of his, it is Ahmad, in 2020. So, yeah, like, it, I know it doesn't sound much, but, like, his filmmaking work is pretty impactful. It's just, uh, it's just too bad, like, uh, MCU, Marvel, and Basam Tariq now going their separate ways instead of him directing. Again, it's not exactly the first time director step down from these big budget projects because of whether it's creative differences or a script not up to of expectations or writers or actors wanting to get involved in this script writing screenplay process so i think for now what's going to happen is yes searching for a new director but i can also see improvements and changes to the actual screenplay for blade when is the release date? I don't. I doubt it's uh, sticking to its initial announcement of next year, or maybe late next year. But yeah, right now, first a new director, and most likely improvements to the screenplay. Listen, guys and gals, I wish I were joking right now. There's an actual movie. Uh, there's an actual movie based on the whole 
Johnny Depp Amber Heard defamation trial. I'm not kidding. There's an actual movie and it's streaming. And it's been streaming since September 30 on the streaming app that I think it's available for free called Tubi, Tubi, whatever it is. You know, you can easily just watch it on Tubi. And I'll, like, and there's a trailer for it. I'm not kidding. It's an actual movie. The trailer has no, I mean, tra the trial itself hasn't even been like, has even been a year since the trial. And already there's a movie based on the whole thing. Let me say it again. Johnny Depp, Amber Heard, defamation trial turned into a movie. Now available since September 30 on Tubi. Whatever how you pronounce it. It's it's free. It's probably like one of those free streaming apps that you can watch that has ads on it. At least that's what I think. So it's called the Hot Take, the Depp Heard Trial. Uh, it is like a Tubi original film, original movie from Fox Entertainment's indie studio, Mar Vista Entertainment. So yeah, like when you think of indie studio, what's that going to tell you? It's a very low budget trial. So of course, like, when a movie like this, indie film, small budget, it didn't cost a lot of money, you know, maybe the quality. I, I don't want to say indie films are going to be poor quality. I, I don't want to go that route because like really indie films, regardless of small budget, whatever the small budget may be, like can really be really good and really creative without the interference of big major studios forcing their input just because of any investments and really major investments that they make. But I'm saying like in this situation, like it's just crazy how it's, how it's all occurred. And like, I, I will, like, I'm just not really impressed. I don't even know why it's happened, how it's happened. All I know is that it's, it's uh, uh, I, I think it's just really like taking advantage of really a difficult situation. Everyone from that trial got involved in. So yes, you can imagine that there's already been casting. Uh, Mark Hopka as Johnny Depp and Megan Davis as Amber Heard. And yeah, there's already been like casting for like all the other actors. Like, uh, oh, let me see. Uh, Depp's lawyer, yeah. Uh, uh, let me see, what's her name? Uh, Melissa Marti as Camille Vasquez and even uh, uh, Mary Carrick as uh, Amber Heard's lawyer, Elaine Bertis, uh Bredevhoft, yeah. At least, like, that's what I'm aware of, of the casting. But yeah, if if you're at least curious, go go check the trailer. It's called Hot Take. Like, like, like it's a thing. Like, like there had to be a movie based on this defamation trial. Like, who, who asked for this? Who wanted this? Like, I, I'm sorry. It's stupid. It's so stupid. Like, I remember, like... It's still fresh on my mind and it's not yet a, a year old. Like all eyes were on this whole trailer. Making fun of Herd, making fun of Depp. Like when you think of celebrity relationships, neither of them were not healthy for each other. They were not good for each other. They were not right for each other. All it did is that it got our attention for the wrong reasons. And clearly a movie like this is going to get everyone's attention whomever is going to be interested for this movie once again for all the wrong reasons so you want to check it out go check it out but don't be surprised at least i'm based on the trailer i'm just going to assume that like there may be a flashback scene he maybe one or two or maybe even more than like a couple but yeah disaster movie that's all i'm just going to say disaster movie For the final topic, I do want to mention some really interesting information that I really do like and I think is really beneficial for everyone involved. Even if you're an Android, iOS, Windows user, whatever it may be, I think it's really cool. So you already know Intel, you know, manufacture of CPU chips or graphics cards and all that good stuff, right? And there's going to be like this uh, Unison app going to be coming like around the holiday season this year. So based on information I found, what I understood is I like how in a lot of good ways, it's going to have like features that will finally bridge the gap of like sharing 
files, data, documents, whatever it may be between Windows PC and those that are using iPhone and Android effortlessly. I like how it's, you know, going to no longer have these restrictions like sharing something from like an Android phone to an iPhone or sharing something from Windows computer to uh, an iMac, MacBook, whatever it may be. At least this is what from I understood. So I really like the, what I've seen. It, it seems really like have a seamless way of transferring files. At least for initial release, it's going to be like on Intel's Evo laptops, at least for now. So it's going to be on Evo, la Evo laptops before it goes to other uh, computer manufacturers. You know, so you could, you know, uh, whether it's like take a photo or a video on their phone, and edit it on their PC, transfer files between different devices, you know, that common stuff. But like now, it seems like it'll be like a Mac OS Windows sort of thing. This is what I like. Even if it's just like text messages, for voice calls, well, I mean, or, or at least sending those things just based on what I understood. Um, yeah, let me, let me just see. There are differences. Uh, Intel told the Virtua there are differences between what iPhones and Android phones can do with Unison installed. You know, whether it's like advanced messaging or, you know, full multi-partying messaging, which could be only like for Android. So... Uh, that's uh, pretty. That's pretty cool, and I like how like for Unison's functionality, it's gonna be uh, similar to what the tool sets that Apple has. And you know, I I like this. You know, Apple users they're familiar with like whether it's um wow, okay, stay stay with me. Whether it's uh you know cloud transfers or sharing, man. There's a term I I've seen at work. It's just, it's driving me crazy that it's leaving my mind. But I think Mac users already know what I'm talking about, you know, even like sharing through iPads and all that good stuff. Uh, man, I'm sorry. You know, it left my mind, but I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. Like, you know, when you have like iPhones or iMacs or MacBooks close to each other and you just can seamlessly just share you, you know, uh, without like using WeTransfer or anything like that, or even Wi-Fi. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the the name left my mind, but uh, what I am aware of is that it's going to be debuting around the, this year's holiday season on all their Lake-based Evo computers and even for like Acer, HP, and Lenovo computers. And the app will be on those Evo devices, so that's pretty cool. Um, and even early next year when like Raptor Lake laptops also become available. Uh, but Intel didn't say when Unison will be available for like other PCs as well, you know. So it's at least good. We know that it'll be for Acer, HP, and Lenovo at least. Uh, you know, speaking on initial releases for 20, this year's holiday season. But yeah, I mean like, you know, regarding like if you're a Mac iOS user, Apple user, you know, again, you know the term that I'm talking about. It's just, I had it in my head, but it's just not there. I'm really sorry. But I I think, like, you know what I'm trying to say here. Like, and I, I'm pretty sure Windows has something similar. Other than, I don't know if, if it's really OneDrive. I know OneDrive, but um, yeah, like, just summarize it overall. I, I'm really glad that there's, and I like the name Unison, just really more of, like, making things, you know, sharing every and all kinds of files between Windows and Mac OS now more seamless, you know, and more integrated with one another than ever before. All right, guys and gals, that's pretty much it for today's episode. That's it for episode 26 of the Films and Pixels podcast. If you have watched and listened from beginning to end, whether on YouTube or any of the audio streaming platforms. Again, thank you. I really appreciate the effort. Thank you for paying attention. I know it's hard to pay attention nowadays, but thank you. It means a lot. You know, wherever you are in the world, whenever you started watching and listening, thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. It means a lot. And please, please, if you can, just 
leave a comment what you liked, what you didn't like, what, what you agree, what you don't agree. It's fine. Also, again, in the description section, um, like and follow the social media links, the pages available in the description section. As always, I will leave links regarding uh, streaming apps if you want to follow, subscribe there. So again, feel free to do so. Thank you uh, to everyone that has supported, even if you're just five people I know that still watch and care about this guy, you know, recording and editing videos and uploading them on YouTube through slow internet. So thank you. And um, this, this is your host, Afif Jamil, uh, the host of the Films of Pixels podcast, saying good day and good